Welcome, everyone, to the Fat Man McNeil uh, podcast, now with 300% more Swedish breakdancing team. <laughs> yes. We need that Swedish breakdancing. I'm not going to forget about Cactar. Cactar and Tom Barry. <laughs> Best animated series ever. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've to gotta, um, use that in my Ruby review. <laughs> what? The... the... <laughs> Remember, remember what, what uh, we had? We uh, we've had this discussion on Skype before. Oh, what was it? What was it? No spoiler questions. <laughs> Great start. <laughs> God. Oh, by the way, vol- episode nine. <laughs> oh, wow, we're, we're already off topic, but we can go with this. <laughs> episode nine. Thoughts. Oh God, I I can't. Have you seen my um, Rooster Teeth journal? <laughs> No, I don't. What, what? No. Okay. Cause yeah, it was. It was. Oh god, episode nine was so painful. It hurt. Yeah. It actually hurt. It's like everything that they had built up to, everything that they had done, was just the worst. Let me try and find you on Rooster Teeth. Uh, it's Mikey Fell. Mikey Fell. Yeah. So yeah, that episode was perfect. Ruby is the best show ever, and if some asshole in a couple of months comes up with a video review that's over an hour long picking on every stupid detail in this episode and all the other ones, I'm going to watch it for two minutes, dislike the video, and leave a shitty comment on telling him to go fuck himself. That'll show him. So in summary, this show's logic is perfect. Miles and Carrie are gods of writing continuity. No one has a gun to my head. Don't be silly. I was supposed to type that last part, or, uh, or you know, I'm just going to hit post right now, okay? <laughs> Wow. Yes. So yeah. Oh man, that episode was so bad. Cinder's speech was ridiculous. Okay. Well, admittedly, it was like the one place where her stupid, phony sounding voice actually fit. Honestly, I haven't the slightest clue as to who is right and who is wrong. Points for that. that yeah. That's points. Where you points want for to that. For what it's worth. Points for that. Although I'm not really sure if that's just, I guess, coincidence and lining up because she hasn't changed. I mean, a, a, a broken clock is right twice, twice a, a day. day. Yes, <laughs> this would be an instance of the broken clock being right. <laughs> okay, so their plan was to kill Penny via Pira. Yes. In order to attract the Grim in the face of a murder on live television. <laughs> Yet everyone knew. It, it's a battle between hunters. I know. How, how, how does no one expect there to be at least one fatality during the course of the fights? I, we may never know. <laughs> like, was this never and, taken into account? Also, where did Penny's aura go? She's, you know, she's a robot, but they made a big point about her being capable of generating an aura, and she's not supposed to be able to get cut up like that. You got a good point. <laughs> Everything about that episode was the worst thing. I I can't like I can't wait to actually get there in the review. I can't wait to like watch it like all again, all as one, you know, thing without taking a break between each week. Dude, I think you might actually literally go insane. I might. I might, but then that'll just make the review better, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll add, I'll add like the actual arc of myself losing my mind while watching this terrible show. Next up on Fat Men Reviews. <laughs> Cinder. <laughs> yeah, that, that's going to be my volume four review at this rate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, on actual topic. Today, we, uh, if you might recall from our last podcast, we challenged each other to watch two different shows. Uh, he challenged me to watch Psycho Pass, and I challenged him to watch Samurai Flamenco. Um, yes, that now, we did. Yes. And so, uh, I'm not sure who wants to start with this one. Samurai Flamenco. I, I honestly wish I could say that I liked it more than I did. Like, I understood what it was doing the whole time. I, I, I like, I, I saw the, um, I saw the, uh, you know, the, the, the through line of it. Yep. But still, I don't really think it was a show for me. The, the, the way I put it, it's not really an anime. 
Oh, I, I disagree. I think yeah. it is an anime. I think I it. I think it is. I think it's just Gurren Lagann with all the bells and whistles stripped out. <laughs> I think it's not an anime. I think it's a religious experience. Oh yes. <laughs> well, I mean, like all good anime, it includes a religious experience. It, it's a show that's ultimately just really silly and has a lot of weird gay overtones. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, it's fair. There's so much jury in the world. You have to give it to the. You have to get it to the Yowie shippers sometime. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's only fair. And it, it's that's true. It's only fair. I mean, when was the last time you saw a show where the last, the main villain at the very end was taken down by nudity? <laughs> you mean besides Kill the Kill? <laughs> Which I just recently watched. Yeah, now that I think about it, the irony there is kind of staggering. Uh, yeah. Well, she didn't beat it with nudity, she beat it with clothing. Yes. Yeah, she, kind of the opposite thing. She she beat it with something that wasn't clothing or nudity. <laughs> it was clothed nudity. Clothed nudity, yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it, it's uh, funny because I have seen that scene before. I just didn't put together that that was from Samurai Flamenco. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I watched it in AMV Hell. <clears throat> That's because Samurai Flamenco is like all over the fucking place. Well, I mean, it seems like the just the because I mean, to do a basic plot rundown of the show, it starts out as Kickass, and then it turns into Batman, and then it turns into the Power Rangers, <laughs> and. Um, then it turns into Roshak from The Watchmen. And then he basically turns into um, the final form of almost any anime. Like, I mean, I said Gurren Lagann, but that's, um, you know, not a... Um, um, what am compare. I looking for? No, that, that's not an absolute comparison. Yeah. Uh, and then... Like the, the thing that got me is at the very end, everything kind of goes back to normal. I mean, doesn't it have to? Yeah, but what I mean is like, like it, instead of like most animes where it's like half of the last episode is everything going back to normal, it's like the last five episodes are like back in like completely normal territory. Like, like, like you go through all this shit where like, okay, he's kick ass, and then he becomes basically goes with the progression of becoming a real superhero. Yeah. And then, all of a sudden, he meets God. <laughs> yes. And everything yeah, that... stops. All the superhero shit just stops. Mm hmm And then, all of a sudden, there's, like, one kid who's like, yeah, fuck you, guy. <laughs> and, like, goes on a complete murder spree around him. Not murder spree, but, like, a terrorist spree around him. Which, yeah. Like, but it was, that was, like, his Joker. That was the guy he created. It was like, I, 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 all of these, like, external forces trying to, trying to, like, uh, I mean, become the forces of injustice in the world, so that he can become the hero that he wanted to be. I mean, like, yeah. when, when they actually, like, come out at the, uh, after, um, Alien Flamenco, and say, like, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm God... I did all of this so that you could become a hero. Do you want something? Do you want something more, or do you want to go back to normal? And he's like, I want to go back to normal. It's like I'm a hero for justice, not a hero for my own gain, which I thought was really cool. But then the evil that he created himself was his like final challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, I thought some of the like. Like, the show itself was a beautiful study in extreme jumps. Like, it just spikes to extremes. Like, at first you're kind of seeing, like, oh, it's like a an anime version of Kick-Ass. And then, what the fuck is that? A gorilla just chopped off a guy's head? Like, what the yes. fuck? Yes. A and then, like, kind of goes into, oh, it's like a Power Rangers type thing where the monsters show up once a day. And then there's, of course, the torture scene where Flamenco Girl is brutally beaten. Yeah. It, it's like, like, the show feels so 
bipolar, but it feels so comfortable with the fact that it's bipolar. Yeah, that makes sense. It just at least when I watched it, um, I remember someone like like there was a page I followed on Facebook that was watching the show, and I was like, eh, it looks kind of interesting. I'll give it a watch, and you know, I I would like to watch an anime version of Kick Ass. And then I got to episode seven, and my mind exploded. <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't exactly sure how to react to that, but I like Batman, so hey, anime Batman, I'm all for that. And then it became Power Rangers, and I'm like, hey, I like Power Rangers, anime Power Rangers, <laughs> or I guess Super Sentai in this case. Yeah, and like it's it just like I, I'm like, I didn't know how to juggle it, and then like all the weird fucking plot twists, like there was a clone of him in the monsters. There was that weird plot twist. Like, I, yeah, I'm not that didn't sure. last very long. That lasted for half a scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I thought the um, um, prime minister was a weirder plot twist. He was an, he was alien flamenco, right? Or was he? N no, he was trying to defeat alien flamenco by getting 100 percent of Japan's support, and the support from the public is what powered his super suit. Right. <laughs> I forgot about that. Which was really awesome. <laughs> well, here's another thing that that I, I I personally liked about it was that everything at least tried to be grounded in reality. As weird <laughs> as that sounds, but like that was actually a key aspect of the show is that Samurai Fomenko himself was still fucking normal. Goto himself was still fucking normal, and in fact, like. So when someone brings up that fucking crazy idea of of the votes powering their suit, they play it straight. Like the show itself even plays it straight. Like, yeah, this is a, this is a thing you can do. This is a, this is a thing that you can do. Totally in real life, you can totally do it. And like, unlike say Kill a Kill, where everything is intentionally over the top and it recognizes that, this show is sort of like, no, this is completely normal. I, at least that's what I got from it. I don't know if you had the same reaction. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I do think. My microphone keeps randomly turning my gain up. I am getting sick and tired of it. Uh, I don't, I don't know if playing it straight was, like, so much as it being internally consistent. I suppose that's as a better way to put it, yes. Because, like, I always liked it when, um, when Goto introduces himself as a flamenco cop. I, I thought that was, like, a really good moment. Goto is perfect because he's the layman that recognizes how stupid shit is getting. Yes. I mean, he, he's he's, he's yeah. basically just Kion again. <laughs> yeah, he is! You're yeah. right, he is Kion. <laughs> Typecasting for the win. <laughs> same actor? Is it the same actor? Yes, it is. <laughs> I, I, had to, I had to look it up because I'm like, this guy is just like Kion. And then I looked it up, I'm like, yep. No, nope, he sounds just like him. He uh, he's basically the same guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh so, my god, Goto's girlfriend was Haruhi, and she disappeared. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's why he got involved with someone who got in contact with God. Okay, this this. If Samurai Flamenco is just a flash forward in the Haruhi series, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Actually, wait, was there someone who looked like Itsuki? I think there might have been on uh, the, the Flamenco team. Mm. Maybe? Maybe? Okay, I'm I getting Flamenco well, She dancing. didn't really have green hair. Itsuki. Not, not Itsuki. Maybe I'm wrong. No, wait, Itsuki was... No, no, there's not. Who was Itsuki? Yeah, because I was thinking of Suyu, Suyura. But Itsuki, was that one of Kion's it... friends? No, I I Itsuki was... um. The Esper? Was that his yeah. name? Yeah, that was his first name, I believe. Oh god, the Flamenco girls. I love them. But they're terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you know, thinking about it, I mean, Goto, Goto got a lot of um, characterization towards the end, and he got, like, a lot more screen time. And so he, overall, was my favorite character. But for the longest time, it was the uh, uh, redhead, uh, Flamenco Ruby, uh, Mizuki something. Did she ever? Did they ever say her last name, or her first name? Mizuki Mizawa. Yeah, her. <laughs> she was like, she was a uh, really like one of my favorite characters throughout the entire thing. 
because she on her she you know like goto understood how ridiculous this entire series was <laughs> and at the end she was just like no no i'm not getting involved it's okay you two can go <laughs> off and and be insane i'm going to i'm going to stay here uh, I actually kind of forgot. The thing is, I kind of forgot about her because she kind of like blurred in with Goto. <laughs> she's uh, she's basically um, Mari's Goto. Mm-hmm. And um, even though she still joins in being friggin' flamenco so, Ruby. Well, so does Goto. He 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 became flamenco cop. <laughs> yeah, but he kind of like got pulled along into it as opposed to like I think Mitsuki had a choice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I suppose she she kind of did. I, I know. I, I guess you're making a better argument than I did. Um, <laughs> she. I mean, I uh, the way that um Mari's you know character was, I really don't know if she had a choice. I mean, she she did. Like she punched her in the face right <laughs> after she had that little breakdown after that scene with King Torture. And Goto told, uh, basically yeah, told on her. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's just been a while since I've actually seen the show, so uh, my memory is kind of a little bit hazy. God, what is it with Ad She's 18 years old. Mari. In fact, they are, they're all okay. Mizuki is the older one. She's 19. And Moe, Moe is uh, 17 years old. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're so... Why? Because, because, I, oh, I guess, anime, I guess, oh, they are idols and idols are pretty young. Um, <laughs> I, I love it. Godo seems more like a 30 year old man to me, but he's 24. Oh, wow. Yeah, he does. He does seem uh, older than he should be. Or older does, than he is. Not my, older than he should be. Who does Hazama remind me of? The main character. I'm trying to think. There's a character he actually reminds me of, but I'm tr struggling to recall who it is. Another kind of weak toast type character, at least in his forward personality, not his flamenco personality. Uh, I swear I've seen this personality before. Uh, oh, well. But... Mm. That is still ongoing. What? Did you say the manga was still ongoing? Yeah, it came out. It's, the manga came out the same day as the original run of the show, but the manga is still ongoing. Where did they go from there? Like, what well, did I, they do after that? Are they done with the King? Is that what they, they just finished around the time of the King Torture arc? I think it's like halfway through the show. The manga went. The manga went less than the show? I, I just think it's because the manga takes longer to produce. But then again, Ido Flamenco. Ido. Uh, wow, they did a... I guess it's more like, like a spin-off type thing. Hmm. Yeah. It, it looks like it's just like, like O makes an extra. It's like there's an, two entire chapters dedicated to that. Or, I guess, one. Interesting. Yeah. And more of them being gay. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that end was um, very, like, I, I don't want to say funny because it was tragic, but just his sort of innocence about everything. Because I don't yeah. think, I I mean I I I, I don't I don't know, I don't well, think that he really meant it in a gay way yeah, like, yeah i think yeah, i yeah. think he meant like you know like let's get married no homo like <laughs> <laughs> but to um you know to help his to help out his friend to, that brings to up um, an interesting quality of um uh, of the main character because um for the longest time my senior professor in english we had this whole debate going about the nature of innocence and how very often he tried to equate it with naivety. And I thought that was 
a faulty argument mm. to make. And I think it, it, it's close, but it's not the same. Um, where Hazama, or what was his name? Has a has a has a has a has a, has a, has a, has a ding dong. Uh, Samurai Flamenco. <laughs> Hazama has a ding dong. <laughs> uh. um, Samurai Flamenco. He um. He, his entire like character is that of pure innocence, not of naivety, because he, he he's aware of the evils of the world. That's why he becomes a hero. I, I mean, yeah. Even on I a mean, even though he starts level. out, you know, Small. yelling at people for littering and smoking in non-smoking zones. Yeah, yeah, but um, like he, he's the he is the definition, I think, of innocence in a written medium. Um, and I think in real life, and I think he's ca- sort of, he is a good ideal to strive for. Yeah, kind I of like when like, he had his conversation with Alien Flamenco, when he's, he said, um, I may be too stupid to understand what you said, but my sense of justice is telling me that this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when he was talking about, you know, like, evolving the entire species into, like, one, um, you know, consciousness. Yeah. That was that was kind of like that was kind of like his defining moment. And he's like, the, the the difference between uh being a hero and being an idiot is paper thin. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, mean, I I like that about him. He's just he's a great character. They had a lot of fun characters in this show. Yeah. Um, what else was there? There was um. There was the uh, one pa- newspaper guy who, like, turned evil briefly. Did they um, ever do anything with him? He was infected with something, didn't Didn't? I don't think he was infected with something. I mean, he... After he... After that, he... I, Like, after he um, turned evil and turned in Flamenco Girl, he... I thought it was implied that he left the country. Like, he, he just fleed Japan. But then, later on in the series, he was just back in Japan. So I don't really know what they did with him. I kind of felt like there was a plot line dropped there. Because yeah. they, they had, like, King Torture set him up to maybe become a monster. Or to feed off of the evil that was already inside him. Or to, like, nurture that. Not really to turn him into anything, but the evil that he already was was good enough. Yeah, something like that. Like, we, we, don't, we don't really get a conclusion to that guy's storyline, did we? Except for the fact that he shows up at the museum. I remember that. Oh, well, he's in it a lot. I mean, he's he's the guy who hunted down um, the the kid's parents. What was that? What was the last guy's name? I, that's another problem with the show. <laughs> it's kind of... <laughs> it has, it, kinda... it has a, like, a lot of characters. I mean, I'm sure that if these were all, you know, American names we would remember well, I, I don't know I mean freaking Code Geass had like a million characters and I can name most of them by name well, those were mostly <laughs> yeah it's true it, it's is a... it's because it what? I mean well first Code Geass was was a longer running show and Code Geass didn't jump around so fast like they introduced all four of the other Flamengers like all at once. In one episode, yeah. And of course there's a uh, Joji Kaname. Yeah, well, I mean he's Red the... Axe. Exactly. <laughs> he was so frustrating for the first part of the show. <laughs> Did she? <laughs> Cause he Almost... just kept disappearing on everybody. Yeah, like, it's like, like no, I'm gonna be in Africa. I'm gonna be in the states. I'm gonna be, you know, over here. I'm gonna be doing this. It's like, oh god damn it! I, I like, you know, because you you build him up as like this completely unreliable kind of douchey guy, but then in the uh, Flamengers arc, he's like the 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 big hero. <laughs> oh, and I just realized his last name. It's the same last name as Madoka from Madoka Magica. Oh, Madoka Kaname? Shoji Kaname. Kaname. So yeah. uh, I, I'm now headcanoning this that he is her uncle. <laughs> and that is like why she is so used to weird shit. <laughs> it, 
So, okay, we've tied together Haruhi, Madoka, and Samurai Flamenco. Let's yes. see how deep this rabbit hole goes. <laughs> uh. Actually, I wonder... Did, did they show an image of Goto's girlfriend? Yeah. They... they uh, maybe. They showed a kind of washed out image of her. Uh, yeah, they showed her without a face. Or eyes, I should say. Eyes and a nose. They gave her a little... It's actually kind of freaky when I look at it. It's actually unnerving me. I'm going to close out of that tab. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, send it to me so I can edit it in. <laughs> It's like, like I think they only like focus on it for like a brief second in the actual show, but the more you look at it, it just kind of gets weirder. <laughs> oh god, that is creepy. I, I know, right? So, any other points about the show you like to bring up? Um, n no, I, I don't really have anything constructive to say about it, which is sort of unfortunate. It's um. It was an experience. It was an ex it was an experience. It was I couldn't recommend adding or removing anything. The the stair step that it had, which is I guess the only way to describe the plot line in Samurai Flamenco is describing it as a stair step instead of a you know, a plot arc. <laughs> Would wouldn't feel right without each individual step but at the same time everything happened er, like okay everything happened way too fast but the the like the the breakneck pace of the of the uh story you know it wouldn't have worked if they had taken anything out but also nothing in it was really important enough to drag on like longer to like give more time to flesh out it was a story about the rate at which things happened, not really a story about those things themselves. That's why lots of the arcs only lasted, like, one episode. Yeah, yeah, it's a story yeah. of escalation. It's... Yeah, it's like, oh, no, we got the, um, you know, uh, From Beyond has four knights. Oh, and we killed all four of those knights within two episodes. And it's like, oh, wait, no, he doesn't have four, he has 65,000. And then they killed all 65,000 of them in the next episode. <laughs> and it, then they... To be fair, didn't, like, one of them turn out to be, like, all of them? They combined after, oh, after right. that. What happened was that Red Axe went and got every other hero to help fight them. Right, right, right. Like, the ultimate Super Sentai thing. I would... Yeah, but that's still was one episode of you know the story but it's like it wasn't about that it wasn't about any of that it wasn't about the prime minister it wasn't about alien flamenco it wasn't about you know um his real or i mean it, it was more about his rise to to power uh which is why they gave that like seven episodes uh, all on its own like he spent like seven episodes as kick-ass basically because it yes. was about his rise and his like exponential rise to um, then eventually meet God and have it explained to him that it was that all of this stuff was happening to him because he wanted it to happen to him. And this is also, I think, uh, a little bit different because um, and for you and me, because I was actually watching it as it was airing. Oh, wow. So yeah. I, I had to wait each week and I was actually watching it with my friends. So we were, we were all like watching at my friend's old apartment. Wow, this was years ago. Wow, 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 wow. It only really hit me like it was only like two years ago, three. I, it came out in twenty thirteen, right? So it was it was it was three years, two or three, it was more like two and a half years ago. Um, yeah. We were watching this come out, and like me and my friends, we had like no idea what the fuck was going on. My friends were getting drunk. I just I stay sober because I just don't like drinking. But like it was funny watching their reactions when they weren't sober. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that's how we watched Rebellion. <laughs> oh, oh god, we need to talk about Rebellion too. But um, I need to I need to go. Uh, yes. All right. Yeah, uh, we'll 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 pick this up at a later interval. All right, Swedish breakdancing team, take it away. Where's the Swedish breakdancing team? 
Where are they? The... Shit. All right, so we're back. We're back. We're back. Yes, we're back. we are. We cut out in the middle of everything. Yes. <laughs> well, luckily we cut out right in the middle, so we are. Um, we're... Well, I mean, we're going to go a little after Psycho Pass, I imagine. Oh yeah, we're uh, probably. So, d did you think of anything to? I don't know anything else to ask me about Samurai Flamenco, or did we talk about? Uh, no, I mostly just wanted to see your, like, like the biggest thing for me was seeing your reaction to episode, uh, seven. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, that was, that was, that was really, like, what, what, the moment. What were you expecting at that point? Like, did you see something like that coming? Absolutely not. No, I didn't. Because that's, that's, like, the most impressive thing about it, is that you really, like, it, the show catches you completely off guard with that. Uh, yeah, it did. I did not expect it. Uh, I, I don't like. I mean, because you told me episode seven, and I was like, "Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> there must be, I, there must be something." I, and I still, I was like, yeah. "Well, I, I, I was very, very. I was trying to be very deceptive because I said it was something about flamenco girl. I think by that point they had, they had, in, had they introduced um, the idea that she and her girls are kind of like, yeah, a thing, but yeah. not a thing." <laughs> Yeah, they I think they did episode. that really, really early. I think they did that like episode two or something. Uh, so, like, I, I said that it was like I told him, everyone, I told him to record himself for episode seven, and I the reason I gave was that naughty shenanigans would go down with Flamenco <laughs> and her girls. I did that. I lied on purpose in order to <laughs> trick you because the last time I asked you to record something, it was the episode sixteen or seventeen of, of Kill a Kill. Kill, a Kill. Where it's that highly sexually, like, charged scene where um, uh, uh, Satsuki's mother does some inappropriate <laughs> things to her in the bath. So, I, if I got you thinking along that late weight link, you would be completely unprepared for the actual <laughs> twist that was coming. Yes, I, was, I wasn't prepared. I, I was not expecting a <laughs> guillotine gorilla. <laughs> Hero team gorilla. <laughs> uh, uh, just like that. Because I, I mean, after that, all of the other twists were like, "Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> oh, I, all right. <laughs> this is new. Okay, we're going with it." But that cocaine to the face, cocaine to the eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, that scene because. Or you know that that guy seemed like he transformed because of something. Like he seemed like he like like took some of the pills in that drug farm. Uh, and but the other of King Torture's henchmen didn't seem like that. Like they didn't seem like they were like normal humans. Yeah. Who transformed? I but mean, they I guess were, apparently. Uh, perhaps, but then you know later on it was revealed. That um, he had the evolution thing from Alien Flamenco. Yep. And that's how all of that went down. Um, well, okay, final thoughts on Samurai Flamenco for you. Um, I believe Samurai Flamenco was well made, but at the same time, not really f for me. But I can't really stand by that very heavily because I enjoyed myself at every turn. Like, it, it wasn't... It wasn't, you know, my type of show. Like, if I, if, I, if I knew what it was from the start, I probably wouldn't have gone in. But at the same time, I enjoyed it all. Alrighty. Good conclusion there. Now on to uh, the big meat, uh, Psycho Pass. And you also watched Psycho Pass 2. Yes, and I'll get to that. Uh, because I, I really enjoyed Psycho Pass 2, believe it or not. I, guess I, yeah. I, I haven't seen it, I just, you know. Yeah, I know you. you I've only heard bad on. things about it, and and I just skipped. Really? It. Yeah. Um, and not only from Digi Bros videos. Not only for Digi Bros, from other people. From other people. Other people who have who have seen it. I have a sneaking suspicion why, and and I'll get to that in a minute because, um, Psycho Pass season one, is awesome, uh -huh. and it, it like it, it's sort of a weird thing because like as soon as I finished it, I sat there and I didn't feel like any type of great revelation. 
like 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 with say like Madoka or with Code Geass or with what I did with Steinscape, where um, I kind of like sat there and I'm like, damn, this was an amazing show. I sat there and I was like, like with this psychopath, I'm like, I came in, I got exactly what I came for. <laughs> um, like like, and it's not in a bad way, not in a bad way. It's just sort of like people said that I, you said that I would like this. Other people have said that I would like it, and. I went in and I liked it. <laughs> it. It's sort of like they like, okay, this is exactly in your niche. And it was. Yeah. And it, it, it like, I, I, I want to be more like enthusiastic about that, but I, mean, it, I already consider it. It ties with Mar Mariah Nikki for number three on my list. And cool. that, that already adds another complication because I have so many ties going on. In the list yeah. Already. <laughs> we, we handled ties in uh, top 10 lists very differently. <laughs> Because, like, if if I have, like, a tie for, you know, if I have, like, a two-way tie for fifth place, I will say, like, you know, the tie for fifth place, and then go to third place. Instead of being like, this is a tie in fifth place, and now here's fourth place. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. I might just, like, do away with the whole numbering system and just kind of give my recommendations yeah. of why I love something. Go, yeah, you know? go with the, uh, the, the YMS um, version of a top ten. Which is, he recommends as many movies as he feels like. That's a good way to do it, because it's honestly, oh god, that top ten video, Jesus Christ. Anyway, on topic, on topic, because derailing, um, Psychopaths, fantastic setup. The, the, the world itself, Gennaro Bucci proves that he knows how to build a world. Um, that the the story, for those who haven't watched it, and those that don't plan on watching it, um, there's a future where I guess it's, it's Japan. I guess Japan's been kind of truncated down to one city. Like that's kind of the implication I've gotten from it because mm, I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate, but well, psychopaths yeah. too kind of illuminates bits of that. Like psychopaths did a lot of expanding on the world that I actually liked, but effectively, um, Japan is ruled over by the Sybil system which is this complex system that gauges the, the likely chance of you becoming a criminal is. And it gives you a coefficient, a criminal coefficient that tells you what, how likely you are to go into become a criminal. And if you go above a certain number, you are labeled as a latent criminal, as a criminal waiting to happen, and you're either recommended for therapy or you're shoved away forever. You, you have to understand when going into this show, it, it's very political. Mm -hmm. And... So knowing someone's political views are important. So I mean, on the on the flat side, I myself an an anarcho libertarian. Um, I have very much believe in very very strongly in personal freedoms. I don't believe in limiting people's rights. So the idea of this dystopian future where people's rights are limited before they even commit a crime. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you called it a dystopia because I I agree with that. Well, here's the thing that I actually loved about this show. It it weighed that balance of being a dystopia and a utopia. Because it's sh like, unlike, say, like George Orwell, where Big Brother is like fucking terrifying. Uh huh. Yeah. And like, why would anyone want to live in this society? It gives you so many reasons you would like to actually live in the psychopaths universe. Y yeah, yeah. It, like, it, it seems like it's something that would actually happen. It seems like, you know, you could take a a democracy to that extreme. Well, it's not even a, a democracy anymore. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's computer not. run. Yeah. But it or, seems like that you could realistically get to that point. It's not like, oh, the world is terrible and, and no one has any rights. It's like, well, no, no. I mean, 100 years ago, everybody had rights and they still do. They're just different rights. Yeah. So... Uh. And the system itself, it's a flawed system, but I can easily see where it's a good idea. Like, 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 even from my 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 own personal political biases, I'd recognize that the concepts behind this idea and how it got implemented makes complete and utter sense to me. Mm -hmm. I caught myself several times saying, "Man, I wish I lived in this society." Like, almost a zero crime rate. You've got. All this really cool advanced technology. Hell, you could live in a drab, boring apartment and actually have it hologrammed so it looks absolutely fantastic. Yeah. 
that, that's a really cool idea. And the fact they actually use that in some of the cases where some of the furniture was out of line with the holograms. Mm -hmm. The personal assistants, I was actually kind of pissed about the little <laughs> squid thing because you've read, you've read the courier. I wrote that and I published it. Yeah. I was like, damn it. They stole my idea. <laughs> <laughs> my little hologram Navi thing. I'm just glad I didn't follow them outside of the house. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like those, you know, like having having a little robot follow you around. I mean, like even you called it the, the little Navi thing. Hey, listen. Hey, listen. The um. Yeah. <laughs> so your idea and... in in uh, the courier was uh, was more creatively implemented than um the um personal assistance in Psychopaths. <laughs> I'm flattered you think so. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, in Psychopaths, they were just sort of there for the sake of being there. Like, kind of like an exposition device. Yeah. The, um... The, but then, like, all the holograph technology fascinated me. The fact that she... Like, like I, I kind of got the implication that she's basically naked under her, her, her holograms. Yeah, okay, that was... That's one of the things that I always... That I never liked about future settings... Is the the holographic clothes? Have you ever seen an anime called uh, Rin, the Daughters of Me Mezzanin? Menzanin? No, I have not. Yeah, okay. In, in that, it's an anime. It's an, an like a six episode anime that spans like I think a hundred years. Um, and in like you know one of the future arcs, it's like how many times do I have to tell you put on some real clothes? Fine. And those real clothes, wear them around the house All too. All right. <laughs> well the thing is like like you don't actually see it in the show but in the opening cut not in the opening um the opening title yeah she's that, wearing like she's wearing like this like metal bracers like are kind of around like that do cover her naughty bits yeah but like barely anything else and i think that might be like the hologram projector but i'm not quite sure yeah but you know in some other episodes the what the clothes that characters are wearing are used you know as plot points. Well, yeah, I, what I think it is is that it's a newer thing, and that she's kind of like an early adopter. Yeah. Or, or, or just something that maybe she's more comfortable wearing more hologram holograms clothes. than other people are. Yeah, she she feels she's not quite as scared about it. I mean, she's she's already proven herself pretty stable as a person. Well, yeah, and, that's the whole point of the show. She's like, she's literally the most stable person. <laughs> Well, and that actually makes me question, is she maybe a, uh, uh, asymptomatic? I don't think so, because in the episode where she had to do the, the brain scan to reconstruct what's-his-name's face? Makashima. Makashima. Uh, they did say that she spiked to over 100, but then fell back down before anything happened. Right, right, right. Uh... So maybe I don't know. She's kind of a weird case. Um, there's some things that I'm in psychopaths too that with her that I really liked, but it made me question like what exactly where she stands in this whole paradigm. Um, <clears throat> where was I going with this? Shogo Makashima is by far one of my favorite villains of all time, <laughs> or I should say favorite antagonist. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say <laughs> because depending. Oh, one minute. Cat got in here. Hold it. Oh, got microphone. No jacks. Jacks. No. Oh my. Sorry. Ah, sorry about that. Cat got in. Don't really know. Okay, so but Shogo Makashima is by far one of my favorite antagonists uh, ever devised, because uh, basically he did everything I would have done if I had his level of intelligence. <laughs> like as I was following the show, like every single choice he made made sense to me, and in fact his acceptance of death and all that, like his acceptance of his what he was doing. Mm -hmm. God, I love that. I love it when a villain admits that he's, like, doing evil, but he's doing it with a purpose. Yeah. And, like, he recognizes, yeah, society hates me for this, but you know what? It needs to be done. Yeah. I need to destroy the civil system. And I actually read an article. Um, it was a very weird article. I was just, like, looking up stuff on Makashima. And I found someone that was talking about how Makashima was right. And this was a guy who was, like, a, I guess a... He's a medieval enthusiast, and he's a hardcore Catholic, and he's a scholar who studies like medieval Catholic uh, Catholicism. And he was talking, even from a religious view, Makashima may in fact be in the right in the situation, even though he is doing an objective evil. Mm -hmm. And it's very weird to see someone who 
is very religious say that in this situation, in this system, he is doing bad, but doing good because of it. Or I should say he's doing good, but doing bad in the method. And that the the, yeah. the, the method is necessary for the case. Mm -hmm. So I found that fascinating. Well, um, isn't um, free will like a big part of um, religion in general? Oh, yeah. 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 Catholicism is huge on free will. Yeah. It's, it's your, it's, it's not like you're, you're not capable of sinning. It's just, you're choosing not to. Yeah. And God, if they remove God that free, choice, what's the point? Yeah. If you yeah. remove that choice, um, God, you know, the idea that God may make you predisposed to certain things and it actually raises an interesting moral quandary. Is it better to be an absolutely good person who does good all his life or to be an absolutely evil person from birth, but to choose to do good instead, which is the better person? I, um, well, like, I mean, that's one of the, um, um, I don't know, de defenses, I suppose, of atheism. Like, I don't need to be threatened with hell to be a good person. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, something yeah. That... It, it, it's a great argument on the, on behalf of atheism and agnosticism. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the, um. Yeah, so, so it, you know, it's like it's like you know both people are good, but is it better to like you know, um, n is it better to not do evil or not have considered it? Like yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's one of those it's one of those moral questions that never goes away. Yeah, it did, and it I don't think it honestly can be answered, or at the, least uh, or at least not definitively, like case by case. Yeah. It, it, it's more of a. It, it it labels by a subjective standard, in all honesty, because everyone's perception of good and evil is different. That's true. Like smacking a baby on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> That's a <laughs> specific. Uh, do we have a personal personal history here? Every single plane flight I've been on, I have had a baby in one of the nine adjacent seats to me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is an unfortunate coincidence. <laughs> I, guess uh, yeah. I, I must fly most, a little more consistently than you. <laughs> um, so Shogo was awesome. Um, Akane was awesome. Kogami was awesome. Yeah. Uh, they were all awesome characters. Oh, before I get to the characters, actually, my favorite scene in the show happens at the eleven in episode eleven, at the mid. The, basically, it is the climax of the halfway point of the season. Remind me. I think I know what it, you're talking about, but it is when 11. he is holding Akane's friend Yuki hostage, and I still remember her name because of that scene. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was that was a very good scene. Not not my favorite, but um. uh, because I, I I don't know. I thought it was just so fucking intense. Like that like you weren't sure. Like we didn't know enough about Akane at that point to decide would she be willing to take another person's life without the guidance of the system. <laughs> and she ultimately wasn't, and her friend ended up dead because of it. And, and well, she, she did she, shoot at him. She did, but she didn't even aim. Yeah. Also. Who the hell holds a fucking hunting shotgun with one hand? <laughs> like, her arm should be broken in like two places because of that. <laughs> yes. At least it's located. I have fired a lower gauge shotgun, and it's not comfortable to do it two handed. Yeah, well, maybe she's a badass. Well, she is a badass, there's no yeah. denying that. Yeah. Um, My favorite scene must have happened later on, but it was back after they introduced the helmets, and it was it was the guy just beating that woman to death in the middle of the street, and the crowd oh God, around yeah. him not understanding what was happening. I get yeah, that was another great scene, and, and the the little like robot scanner is like going up to the woman being beaten, like, "Hi, you're stressed. Stop being stressed, or we'll arrest you." <laughs> And she's being just beaten on, and no one knows what's going on. And that was kind of like the moment in Psychopaths that made me be like, wow, this is totally a, a dystopia. Yeah, this <laughs> Something this is, is going easily, wrong. Yeah, this is an easily breakable system. And um, Another thing I appreciate is that Makishima, like, like one thing about dystopian literature and dystopian works, they usually shy away from referencing other dystopian literature. How should I put it? The city is like a parody of the sort of novels I used to read when I was younger. 
Oh yeah, what kind? Like a William Gibson book? Like like directly referencing it. Like mm -hmm. usually they'll have like allusions to like Orwell or Dick or other things like that. But no, Shogo Makashima is like, yeah, I read Animal Farm. <laughs> More like Philip K. Dick. Not as controlling as the society's George Orwell depicted in his work, and not quite as wild as those in Gibson's either. Yeah, I, I read 1984, but I think it's more of a Philip K. Dick situation. Have you ever heard of, of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Philip K. Dick, huh? So if I wanted to check him out, which one should I read first? Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It's a classic. I'm sitting here, I'm like, I've read all these things, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right, this is... Right on par. I think it was intentional to make to make it seem like psychopaths took place in the real world. Yes, but that's that's the thing. Like all these other dystopias take place, quote unquote, in the real world, and none of them reference Orwell. None of them reference any of the other dystopian authors. The thousands that we've had over the years. It was something that I had never really seen done before, where like they're just like, oh yeah, these things exist, and despite these things existing. This society still wound up happening. Mm hmm Like, maybe even in spite of the fact. So that was something that I found inherently, like, appealing. Um, the other characters I found very interesting. Um, Ginoza, I thought, was yes. an interesting character. I liked Ginoza, uh, especially since he seemed like he really was an asshole throughout the most of it. But as soon as he was, like, proven wrong and his father died and he failed, God... That really worked really well. And then, yeah. of course, his father, Masaoka, great, great. I always love the veteran characters who really just, like, do not give a shit. Yeah, that's my favorite um, general archetype of character. Yeah, you're, you're, I mean, you're seeing, like, three of them in my my novel when I'm, I'm having you review it. Yes. I have, like, three of the same, three of similar characters, but they're all different. Um, Kagari was very fascinating because... In all honesty, if I wasn't an asymptomatic criminal like Shogo Makashima, I could easily see myself winding up as Kagari, being like being picked up at the age of five. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was labeled a latent criminal at the age of five. Like that's how fucked up the society is. Kids are being imprisoned. Yeah, j just for like yeah, because I mean, what kid isn't evil? What kid doesn't or just not understand the consequences of their actions to the point where they would consider hurting people? To quote um, Sundowner from uh, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, Kids are cruel, Jack. But we teach them about love and compassion and they lose that cruelty. But instead, we're making them fester in it. <laughs> God, I love well, Sundowner's really kind of an asshole. Um but it, that's the point. Kids are cruel. They they don't understand the the, the consequence of their actions. Mm -hmm. um, my sister just brought me up a, a plate of uh, pigs in a blanket. It's awesome. Nice. And the fact that Kagari died in the middle, I was actually very disappointed in that that, that fact because we didn't really get to know too much more about him. He gets like one scene at the very beginning, and then he gets that one episode to himself, and then dies. Yeah. Similarly with Yayoi. Yeah. Yayoi gets, like, one episode that's completely unrelated to the rest of the series. Yeah, just, just to flesh her out. Pretty much every reason why people are imprisoned is bullshit. It's just like, what, she's listening to, she's listening to, like, bad punk rock, and that's what got her, you know, labeled a latent criminal? Listening to too much, like, angsty music? I didn't find she was very well developed as a character. She didn't really didn't do much. In fact, it turns out... She hardly did anything at all. Yeah, yeah, like, why was she there? She felt superfluous to the story. Uh, with the exception of the fact that, like, apparently she's the drone specialist of the team. But that's never brought out, except for in, apparently, the novel. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, she was, she was hired. Like, she wasn't directly related. I mean, I'm gonna hit the restroom. All right. So I'll be back. Okay. And I'm back. So where were we? How, like, um, Yayoi yeah, and Kagari didn't really do that much? Yeah, and that's kind of the thing. Like, like, Digibro said that... Compared to Jen Urobuchi's other work, that the characters from Madoka Magica weren't as well fleshed out. They weren't very well developed. And I actually take issue with that because in Psychopaths, we get three incredibly well developed characters. I'm not denying that. Akane, Shogo, and uh, uh, Kogami are all brilliantly developed. They are all amazing characters, and I love all three of them. But everyone else kind of falls off the end. 
Ginoza and Masaoka are interesting, but I kind of saw Masaoka dying as soon as I hit sort of like the 15 episode mark. I'm like, yeah, he's probably going to get killed. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Kagari and Yayoi never really did anything. Yeah, but I think that kind of, I don't know, they lends to their role in the world more so than their role in the story. I mean, it, it's their job. Like, that's what they do. They are just the enforcers. Enforcers exist in teams of four, so there are four of them. Well, I acknowledge that, but it doesn't feel like it facilitates the story. And that's also like, I, don't know, I feel like if you have characters, they shouldn't just be doing nothing unless that is their purpose. And I don't think that was their purpose here. I don't think that was intentional. Mm. Like, except for maybe Yayoi, who, in all honesty, they could have done without her, her individual episode. Yeah, but it still, like, sheds some light on how the civil system works. Yeah, it does. Oh, I, I do kind of want her ex-girlfriend to come back. I, I, uh, yeah, I wonder where she, you know, got away to. That whole that whole movement just sort of, like, fell apart. But, like, they were talking about how the characters in Madoka Magica followed, basically, were just tools of the plot. But I counter that argument by saying, yes, the plot might have been written first and the characters second. But the thing is, the characters were born out of the plot, and thereby the plot is also... They are not necessarily agents of the plot. Their motivations move the plot forward. Whereas in this, it feels like there are several characters who just kind of go by the wayside and don't really affect the plot at all. And I find that's a waste of space and time, unless you have a purpose behind that. Kagari is on the short side of that, because he had the oh shit death and like, the, the, the realization of what the civil system is. That's fine. He, he, I wish he would have been developed a little bit more, but but honestly, what we got with him was fine. It's mostly Yayoi I take issue with, which was actually fixed somewhat in a very weird way in the second season. Okay, so I don't know about that. Exactly. Oh, I forgot to mention my favorite thing about season one. The entire virtual world segment. Oh, yeah. That was fucking awesome. Like, just the way they portrayed everyone, especially the... Uh, was it Kogami that went in with Akane, or was it Masaoka? Or was it Ginoza? I can't no, remember who went in. I don't think it was Ginoza. I thought she went in alone. I thought that was the point. She went in alone to talk to the person that she knew from school. When they first went in, they went in together. Because she walked in as her avatar, which is really fucking weird looking. And the other guy, I think it was Kogami or Masaoka. It might be Masaoka because it would make sense for him. But he was a dime. His <laughs> avatar was a dime. <laughs> Or like a, a nickel or something like that. <laughs> it was some kind of form of currency. Interesting. I thought that was just like really creative and amusing. The The second season, the plot is not quite as good. The villain is not quite as good. I didn't find him quite as interesting as Shogo. And I think that's the big, the big point that people kind of diverge on the series. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves, I think everyone loves Makishima as an antagonist. This guy kind of, the new guy felt kind of like Makishima light. Like he tried to be smooth and emotionless and uh, and and calm but i honestly found him kind of boring as a villain and his ultimate motivation was interesting like like the the the, the science behind why he was the way he was and all that kind of stuff but ultimately it, it just kind of led to he kind of fizzled as a villain mm -hmm. that's i think where a lot of people find issue what i like though was that psychopaths 2 focused a lot more on the characters and uh, end of things Every character kind of got a focus, and it played very well to the character dynamics. Ginoza, as an enforcer, is a very interesting character, because he's basically trying to follow in the footsteps of his father now. Mm -hmm. Like, he recognizes, well, I'm, it's too late for me, I might as well just kind of embrace what my father did. The new um, agent that comes along, that you introduced to at the end of the last season, in the new season... She's a very interesting character, voiced in the English dub by one of my favorite voice actors, Charami Lei, who is, uh, she voices Suzuha in Steinsgate and Lucy Hartfella, Hartfelia in Fairy Tale, if you're familiar with those. She was Sailor, Sailor Venus. She played Sailor Venus in Sailor Moon. Huh, I didn't know that. But did you know that um, the end of season one wasn't the first time we were introduced to that character? Yeah, yeah, I recognized her voice as soon as she started speaking. I thought that's a great way to bring her back. In the second season, she's actually very, very challenging of Akane. Very critical. And she's very much a by-the-books type of uh, agent. And Akane isn't? Akane isn't. Akane is willing to do alternative tasks and violate standard protocol in order to get things done. But she does it effectively and with purpose. 
and she follows routes that other agents think is unusual, but end up usually being right. Kind of like every other detective procedural ever. She herself is kind of challenged by the fact that she's not doing this for the greater good like Akane is. She's doing this for her own personal glory. Huh. And that is an interesting character motivation in and of itself. And then she learns the truth behind the Sybil system, and she has a complete mental breakdown over it. <laughs> they just can't keep that a secret, can they? <laughs> Well, they let her in because she was getting too close to the truth about, like, one of the enforcers who has the highest recorded psychopaths in history. And he wasn't killed? And that seems like it breaks the lore of the show. <laughs> he wasn't killed because he was actually raised by the civil system. He was born to be asymptomatic, but when his mother died, his asymptom thing, it, it's not really fully explained, but basically he snapped. And he has like a, a, by the end of the series, he has a crime coefficient of like 700 something. Because it turns out her, his mother becomes part of the civil system. And in fact, it actually improves the lore for me because it shows that the civil system is in fact flawed. Well, like we already, knew, we it already knew it. We already knew that. Yeah, <laughs> but it was flawed in different ways. The fact that it facilitated this criminal existing. Yeah, see, that's the kind of thing that makes the entire thing seem, um, I don't know, backwards. Like, how do we get, you know, less crime? More crime! It was a, well, the experiment itself was, he was born to produce an asymptomatic person. And they succeeded at first, but then he snapped. Okay. So the entire study was logical for them, because they wanted more people like themselves to judge. Ultimately, though, the, the, the characters I found far more developed. Akane gets pushed to the, her extreme because her mother, her grandmother gets killed. In fact, Togany, the, the enforcer, is the one who does it, but they try to frame the villains for it. And Akane doesn't have any of that shit. It's great. Here I am thinking, she has a grandmother? And one of your grandparents. Hmm, your grandma. She was affectionate with you. I don't know. I don't know. It seems, it seems like I don't remember her having a grandmother. It was never really brought up, and I'm yeah. glad it wasn't. The Season 1 didn't really explore their personal lives all that much. I didn't mind that. <laughs> Season two delves a little bit into it till you see that. I found the characters just more well developed in the second season. Like Togane was awesome. Mika Shimotsuki was pretty awesome as the way she like had her brain absolutely blown by everything. <laughs> There's a guy named Sho who shows up and no, he doesn't do too much. He still does something because he specializes in holograms and they make a point of that. And his entire thing is like the, the bad guys are using holograms to escape detection. So they actually have him work up all these fake holograms to cross compare. They they worked up holograms to escape detection. What they did is they took the entire roster of a um, flight that had crashed of all these kids that were on it, and they aged them up in order to create holograms that like hologram covers that they could walk around freely. That would somehow disguise their psychopaths. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. Um, but the main villain had sort of a way of suppressing people's psychopaths. Okay. He has, like, contagious asymptomaticness? He's a pharmacist. Oh. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, okay, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Basically, he knew the right... Like, yeah. The thing is, like, the one interesting uh, one interesting thing about him was he was doing this to to clean people. He wanted people to have clear psychopaths. He could do that. He actually like knew all these techniques that could naturally uh, suppress the psychopaths of people, and people could just go on murder sprees without their psychopaths rising. <laughs> uh. it, it it was a really cool idea. He's like, okay, well the combination of drugs uh, of very precisely measured pharmaceuticals and a little bit of therapy, you too could have a permanent, not permanently low, but a relatively low psychopath for a consistent period of time. That's interesting. Like one of the, my favorite parts about him is that he actually turns an agent to his side. Okay. But he takes her eye so that he can actually jury rig a way for him and people he gives the weapons to use dominators. Interesting. Yeah. One reason I liked Yayoi better in the second season is that she didn't serve too much more of a purpose, uh, but she was more involved in the action sequences. Like, she was actually, like, at risk of dying several times, as opposed to just kind of being there during hey, chaotic moments. But not only that, she served, like, with as um, abrasive as the new agent was, she had a soft spot for Yayoi because Yayoi was the one who comforted her in the wake of her friend's death. 
if you notice that little bit in season one, she's being comforted by Yayoi. Mm -hmm. And so in the second season, she actually kind of looks down on enforcers. It's kind of implied that maybe she even has a crush on a crush on Yayoi. Um, and that I'm actually hoping that goes somewhere because <laughs> Yayoi and Shion is pretty clear at this point. They're just kind of friends with benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Yayoi might actually be looking for something more because she teases she teases uh mika but she also acts as intermediary for mika she actually kind of like with the rest of the team when mika's being more abrasive yeah you always like chill mika we got this uh listen everyone else uh mika thinks we should do this and i think she might be right on this regard so let's focus on this and like kind of playing mediator for everyone so she actually had an expanded role in the team purely based on character dynamic and that's what i was looking for that right there was like what elevated Yayoi to more of a, a predominant character. She actually had bounce with the other characters more than anything. And she seemed to have a more amiable relationship with Ginoza. <laughs> well, considering they're the they're like the only two left from the original team. Yeah, it seems like she would have more of the power in that relationship. Because he used to be her superior who looked down on her. She treats him as an equal and he treats her as an equal. Well, that's very big of her. Yeah. And that, that, like I said, that elevates her in my mind. Like little touches like that, which we didn't get in season one. At least, at least I didn't notice in season one. I could be wrong because it's been a couple of weeks since I've seen it because you're really slow at watching these damn things. Yeah, that's true. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> Next time, though, I'll wait for you to finish it and then I'll binge it. <laughs> Where was I going with this? So, yeah, Yoyo was better developed. All the other characters were better developed in, in the second season. Even the psychoanalyst guy that Kogami goes to at the very end of season one and they, they talk to earlier in season one. Yeah. He comes in as a reoccurring character. Did they, did, did they like, arrest him because his psychopath was higher? He turned himself in. Um, okay. Which I, the guy is very, very intriguing. Another good point in psychopaths to favor is that Kogami doesn't show up at all. Like in physical, in person. Did you watch the movie? I've not watched the movie. The movie is different. I'm not. I'm not judging yeah. the movie yet. Kogami doesn't show up, with some exception. Like we see that Akane obviously misses him, and I'm not sure if she actually smokes, but she at the very least lights cigarettes and let them burn in her house, in order to try and recreate the feel of having him around. <laughs> Which I thought was a cute little touch with her. And I think she might actually smoke, but I'm not sure, which I thought was like, at first I was like, ooh, Akane smokes? No. But I kind of thought, I'm like, well, no one's perfect. And she misses him dearly. So if she smokes, it could be seen as her way of reconnecting with Kagome, uh, Kogami. Uh, I almost said, Kagome! Kagome! Difference of one letter. <laughs> yeah. He shows up twice in the series. Once just an audio and once as sort of like one of those inner m mental monologues that she's having with herself. What if she's basically talking with herself, trying to talk through the problem and looking at it from Kogami's perspective. Yeah. And I thought that was like one of the most one of the most poignant scenes because it brought back a character we all love, but did it in a very fitting way for how. Akane works. It shows a lot about Akane as a character, how she doesn't necessarily use her own reasoning. She uses someone else's reasoning through her own reasoning. Yeah, it's like there's no reason to talk to someone who agrees with you. You don't, like, I know what I would say. I don't need someone to reaffirm that. I need someone who disagrees with me. Exactly. The way they did that, I thought was very tactful, very, very smart, and I'm glad they did not shoehorn Kogami back into a chaotic situation. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand he comes back in the movie, mm -hmm. um, and I think that makes a little more sense because apparently they're, like, outsourcing the civil system in that into, like, I, I, a different I country. Know. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either. Like, I just know, like, a basic premise. One thing that they, write, they, they, they bring up in Psycho Pass 2 that never really gets explained very thoroughly is how the military functions exactly. The military is supposed to be all drones, mm. and they actually have an entire thing where, like, the villain has hacked the drones... And put like a hollow scape over their cameras so it appears to be a video game. And then basically gives all the controls out as a free update for a video game to people around the city. I remember that from Digibros Review. <laughs> Which I thought is like fucking terrifying because they're just mowing people down left and right. And no one realizes they're actually committing murder. <laughs> so so that was that was pretty cool. Um 
but they never explain exactly how the military defends the nation when the nation has a law against being even prone to violence. Mm. Like, how are the drones supposed to work? How are you supposed to program something that violent? It rose a few questions in my head. I think people are complaining because it did bring issues with the lore, but I was happy with it because it brought home some of the characters like I'd hoped they would. Hmm. And another thing, like, I realize, I think Gen Urobuchi does better with shorter projects because with shorter projects, you have to write more tightly. Well, when he you... wasn't involved in um, Psychopaths 2. And Psychopaths 2, I know that. Yeah. I'm talking about Psychopaths 1 now. Yeah. Um, switching back on topic. Because it, was, because it I... was like 26 episodes where his other shows are much shorter. Yeah, Madoka Magica was 12 episodes. Gargantia was 12 episodes. And I think they are much more tightly written and much more effectively written. And I also think part of it is that in a Madoka Magica, he really didn't have to do all that much world building because he had the benefit of just saying it's the modern day and now there's this weird stuff as opposed <laughs> yeah. to completely reworking society from the ground up and developing and explaining what events led to what happening, like figuring out how did the civil system come to power? Yeah, like, it, It's never thoroughly explained how, though in Psycho Pass 2, they do explore some of the issues with it and the fact that the civil system tries to protect its own existence. When there was a huge program to change how like traffic was monitored and uh, how transportation worked, the civil system intervened and actually caused, ended up causing several hundred, uh, actually several thousand deaths during like, a, it was like a, like a week of blood or something like that. Like, I can't remember what they named it. Several people died, including that plane that crashed, killing all of the main villains classmates huh. including him he technically is a frankenstein that's his big thing is he's a frankenstein of 31 different children <laughs> and it that it part yet it's ridiculous it is ridiculous but it actually for a society as high level as this it actually gives me an interesting view into their scientific experience that they're at the level where this kid was barely alive so they frankenstein together all these different parts of different kids <laughs> And that completely, like, overwrote his biosignature. That's insane. That's crazy. It's crazy, but I actually think it was kind of cool. On, on paper, the, the, the main antagonist is really interesting, but he just is really a boring character. Like, the, his, his portrayal is very boring. Well, yeah, I mean, how do, you, how do you write somebody who's 31 people? They did one interesting thing where at the very end, he was walking down a hallway calmly with Akane, and while he was talking to her, like, as, like, the camera shifted, he changed into a different representation of another child inside of his mind. But did they Frankenstein his brain? With one other person, I believe. But, okay. like, his biosignature, because of all the different parts in him, was radically different than what it should have been. It wasn't able to be read. That's... Okay. All right. <laughs> it, it's sort of like, think of it like how when you try to read people's faces, all the muscles that work in tandem with each other. Yeah. Think of someone who has muscles from 31 different people. There's still like a, there's still it, like, it, like a, like a brain impulse controlling those muscles. Yes, but they don't work the way they should. So it's h much harder to read. And in fact, there is a way for the civil system to read it. They just chose not to because the big thing with that is that if they could read collective entities, that means they could judge themselves. And the big thing at the end of the series is the main villain pointing a dominator at the system after like it started reading him, like they, the, the system started to read him. He pointed his dominator at the system, and the system finally read itself, and the civil system had a crime coefficient of 350-something. It, it should have a crime coefficient of zero. Well, then, like what they did... <laughs> <laughs> Why? So wait, after you remove a brain from a body, it stops being criminally asymptomatic? My theory is that people who were put into the civil system before asymptomatic people became the norm. Oh. Like, I mean, who's, like, who started the system to label asymptomatic criminals? That's true. So all of those people combined. They were bad apples. Oh, okay. Maybe not even all of them. So maybe some of them were asymptomatic or were just good people. We don't know. Interesting. Uh, but what happens is the civil system is like, don't worry, you don't need to kill us. And so it gasses and burns all of the brains that are responsible for the high cro crime coefficient. <laughs> That's crazy. I, 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 I thought it was actually pretty cool. I, I honestly thought it was a pretty cool way of doing things. And I think he still didn't... Gen Urobuchi still have sort of like an oversight position on this series. I think he told them. I think he told them things not to do. But other than that, 
because like all, all that I have you know to go on is TG Bros videos, I, and I'm pretty sure I remember that he said that the only it, oversight Gen Urobuchi had was that he told them things that were going to be in the movie that they had to leave alone. And maybe that's why uh, Kogami didn't appear in the, uh, the series. Let's see. But yeah, so there, there are my thoughts on it. And like I said, a big thing for me is characters, but also plot. Like, like people are like, well, you favor characters over plot or plot over characters. It's not like that. It's not like that. For me, it's how do the characters serve the plot and how is the plot served out of the characters? And that is why I still think Madoka Magica is a superior piece. Because the characters in that all had their own motivations, and it's because of those motivations that the story happened. Yeah. As opposed to this, where the story just kind of sometimes happened to the characters, and sometimes was affected by the characters, but it didn't really feel quite as cohesive and natural as Madoka Magica did. I wouldn't say natural. I, uh, really? Well, no, no, like, I, I, I mean, I, I, think, yeah. I think natural is the wrong word. Yeah, it is the wrong word, you're right. Uh, because, I mean, Shogo Makashima was still out there doing things, and he kind of caused the whole plot issues, so it makes sense. Yeah, because characters, yeah. like, not doing anything, or, like, not, you know, characters, like, not being involved, that actually is more natural than every character being involved. I can see what you mean. But, yeah, like, I, I don't know, it, it doesn't feel quite as cohesive as a story. Um, when it, not, not cohesive, like, cohesive is the wrong word again. I keep using it saying no, the wrong word. I, see, I, I think I think you're using cohesive and natural in the wrong ways. See, I would say something like Madoka Magica is very cohesive because everything has a purpose and every purpose drives the story. So you can't really remove any elements. And Psychopaths seems like it's more natural as something's happening and these are the people who have to deal with it. And not all of them are directly involved. Some of them, it's just their jobs. Some of them don't want to be doing it. And some of them have personal, you know, vendettas to to work through. Yeah, no, I, I okay, yeah, I think that's a, a fitting way to put it. Because um, actually, I got in an argument over about the characters in Madoka Magica versus, like, the characters in Yuki Yuna as a hero, which I recommend you watch that. It's a pretty good show. Someone was saying that we, the, the characters were better developed in Yuki Yuna, and I was arguing that Madoka Magica developed their characters better. But what we kind of came to an agreement is that, like, we actually don't know too much about Madoka's characters on a superficial level, or should I say, on a surface level. Yeah, that is that is kind of... Like, and that, that, that was what Digibro kind of had an issue with. That's why I think he said that the characters in Psychopaths were more developed. But yeah. I think that's also wrong to say that they're less developed than psychopaths because psychologically I, we again get the, it's it's the it's the thing that everyone does they use developed and established wrong never met anybody besides me who uses those words properly <laughs> well then educate me educate me i would i would love to know your view on this so to establish a character is where they are at ground zero i mean they weren't born on the day the plot started like they weren't born on page one if you're explaining or enlightening the audience as to what they were before the story started that's establishment development is them ch changing from that starting point things affecting them and changing what they are uh, here's a question what do you call a character study then because a character study doesn't involve development a character story is a study of a person at that one period of time how do you define that in that context if they're telling a story about something, there's something happening, right? Yes, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change a character. It it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that. It what it could mean is that we're going to see a character act in the way they've always acted. Yes, that would be th Would that be establishment or development? Well, that's action. That's that's acting. Like okay, establishment is what hap is what they are, and then action and reaction happen and then development or not i see so if you're just if you're just acting and you don't develop because of that then that's i guess more establishment okay yeah that that, that, that puts things into better uh, better uh, uh context because the characters in madoka magica are well developed yes i agree but they're not necessarily too well established yeah we don't really know all that much about them we, we don't know about like the the frivolous side of them. Yes, like personal likes and dislikes. We know the what. We know Sayaka likes music. 
We know Madoka likes pink and fluffy an- stuffed animals and fluffy <laughs> animals in general. She likes cats. Uh, that's a, that's one thing I think that some people don't realize. You can take the entire opening to Madoka Magica and point to it as character establishment. <laughs> yeah. Hey, all this stuff, it's happening. It's real. It's all real. <laughs> Everything <laughs> in that opening is real. And thus, you can actually gauge how these characters actually behave. More so Madoka than anyone else. We get kind of like the implication that she's a klutz. She she's kind of a mess up at times, especially with that opening where she's trying on different magical girl outfits. <laughs> we get like all the different uh, character dynamics, uh, but they're well developed in the series, as opposed to say psychopaths, where they have, actually have a similar problem. Now that I think about it, Akane isn't all that well established. Uh, although we do see her friends and her social life. Yeah, I, I would say Akane is more established... Than anyone else. Than, uh, maybe except for... no Kogami? Who, Kogami, yes. Uh, I, 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 Kogami, so there's Kagari and Kogami. I know, I got confused by that too. Yeah. Um, well, Kogami... The thing with Kogami is that all we know is that he was a detective that turned latent because his partner died. Well, because he felt responsible for his partner's death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but he was like, so he was so like integral to the backstory of of Makashima that he got established almost coincidentally as um Urobuchi is very focused on the on telling the story. He doesn't really do much uh like extra. So the character details we get are a side effect of moving the story forward. And, in turn, because there is a change in the characters, that itself moves the story forward. And that's sort of like the natural flow I kind of feel with Gendo Roberti's style, is that it's sort of an ebb and flow between the story needs this to happen, we need a character motivation that fits that. Yeah. We have a character with that motivation, they affected that change, how do the other characters react? The other characters react this way. The story moves forward that way. We need the story to move in this direction now. How do we change that? It, it's very logical, and it, it makes a lot of sense to me. The But Kogami and Akane are very well established and very well developed. Uh, Shogo Makashima, he's not very well developed. He is purely action-based. He doesn't yeah. change throughout any of it. He just goes... Well, I mean, that's the that's the, uh, the asymptomaticness of him. Exactly. He, yeah. He understands what he is, and he understands what he's doing. He's... He's planned it out, and he's not going to let anything stop him, except for bullets. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. I, I still need to do my little skit thing. I, I have. Uh, I had a skit thing involved with that very last scene between him and Kogami. Uh, you, you'll, you'll probably see it if I can edit it together. It's going to be a bit difficult because I have to learn how to do mouths in animation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, frame by frame. Oh God, no. Frame Why me? by frame. <laughs> Okay, so Rebellion. What did you think of it? Oh, I loved it so much. It was the best. Really? <laughs> it was so much, it was, it was like so much better than the show. And the show really? was already really fucking good. <laughs> really? Like, like, after I saw like Digibro actually kind of bashed it. The film is a total clusterfuck. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, different, different strokes for different folks. <laughs> I like, I, I don't. I don't think Digibro is really like. I mean, nobody is an authority on taste. Of course. Like, like I've always said, you never have to defend what you like. You only have to defend what you think is good. Because I couldn't defend uh, the movie Shoot 'Em Up. I love that movie, but it's terrible. I can't defend it. <laughs> but do you think Rebellion is good? Oh, um, yes, I, I, I do. I, I mean, not you know, you, not perfect or not. Of course. I mean, I'd say that quality-wise, it's on par with, you know, the rest of the, the series. But I just, I loved it so much. Oh my god, you're like the first person to agree with me on this! <laughs> like, like, everyone else is like, well, Hermura wouldn't do that. Fuck you, you don't know what yes, she would! would. <laughs> yes. Hermura did nothing wrong! Hermura did nothing wrong. <laughs> she's, uh, she's the best. That reminds me, we still don't have a name for this podcast. We don't. Um... Hey uh, fans, do you want to name a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Give us ideas. We'll send you a pizza roll. Actually, no, I'll I'll, I'll send you a pig, a pig in a blanket. <laughs> Did you get kind of the thing that I was implying? Why all the things happened in Rebellion that they did? Like, mm. like it, it's a uh, it, it's a Yuki Nagato situation. Love. Well, they kind of explained it. 
Your tainted soul gem should have disappeared with your soul. Why? The only, like, logical leap you'd have to make for that explanation to work is that, um, being a witch is linked to your memory. Because... I remembered why I repeated time. The darkness that builds up inside magical girls is linked to their memory. That, that, that's, that's the only real logical leap you'd have to make to fill in the plot holes. Well, yeah, but not only that, but I'm talking about why Homura did what she did. Love. I'm talking about motivation here, not, not, not world building. Oh, well, yeah, her, her motivation is Love. pretty straightforward. She I... didn't want to lose Madoka. <laughs> Well, it's not only that. I think it's actually a little more complex than that. Love. I mean, it goes back to the same core principle. Here she is in this new reality where Madoka doesn't technically exist. Yeah. Yet she has possibly thousands of years of memories with Madoka and fighting for Madoka yeah. and suffering for Madoka. And now she's in this reality where Madoka's dream has come to fruition. Mm -hmm. But she's being told constantly. Madoka, is that right? That's it. Tatsuya came up with an imaginary friend to play with when he's alone. That Madoka doesn't exist. And slowly, why she initially became a witch in the first place is important. The reason I chose to become a magical girl was to save Madoka. She fell into despair because she herself started to forget Madoka. Well, she says that. I remembered why I repeated time. My feelings for Madoka. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah. I, I don't, it's the thing, it's like, like they were like bitching about Homura and the way she did things. And I'm like, you guys don't really know what it's like to suddenly start like having lived an entire lifespan at the minimum and then having been told it's all a lie and then starting to believe that lie and basically having everything that built your life up mean nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So like her madness there, at least it makes sense to me. And dear God, I loved how crazy that, that the movie got. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I liked when she, um, did she kill Kyube? Or, or, or she, what happened to Kyube? She basically, uh, repurposed him. The curses that have spread across our world still have to be dealt with. She repurposed Kyube to be sort of like her henchman. And you incubators have become necessary for that task. Yeah. You know, one thing that struck me while I was watching that is, Kyube is an incubator. Incubator? I, I, I don't know if that was supposed to be obvious, but... <laughs> Jesus Christ, I didn't... <laughs> Goddamn Japanese! They're fucking me over with my own language! <laughs> um, there was originally, like, back in the early days of the fandom, Kyubi was spelled with a Q. Oh. Well, no, you, well, no. Yeah. But... Well, I mean, in Japan, he wouldn't have been spelled with a Q or, or, or a C. Yeah, they would have been spelled with a... Uh... With a character, a kanji character. <laughs> Or something. I don't think it's a kanji character because it's a unique word. Um, it could be katakana. Should we look it up? I, I'm interested in that because I'm, I'm learning Japanese. In fact, next Monday I'm going to my first class. Nice. Kyube is written in a mix of hiragana and katakana. Hmm. Uh, you can mix those? The Japanese language is so weird. Sort of? Like, they also like use changes between hiragana, katakana, and kanji to denote spaces. Like, they don't have spaces in their language. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, that I don't take back what I said about the written language being weird. <laughs> what <is> borders? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what other country has multiple alphabets that they switch between instead of just entering spaces? What does a Japanese keyboard look like? What? What does a Japanese keyboard look like? Oh, God. Um. Well, actually, I, I think it's kind of weird because, like, the I think it's in hiragana initially, but there's, like, maybe, like, a control button to enter hiragana, hmm. and they have an autocorrect built in for when you write something that could be written as a kanji, it autocorrects to a kanji. Interesting. Because I actually have a Japanese keyboard on my phone, and um, it, it's kind of weird how it's set up. It basically, I don't know how to, I don't know how to uh, say it. What? Oh, I just looked up Japanese keyboard. It's like a big old circle. I don't think that's what they use. Y yeah, I hope that's not what they use. <laughs> what the hell is that? It looks like it looks like a whole bunch of kanji characters. Wait, there's over two thousand kanji. You can't fit them all on one keyboard. Have you seen the? Did you see the next picture over? What? What? The... <laughs> uh. <laughs> wow. Two two thousand kanji. You say. <laughs> I think that's enough buttons. 
I think that is, but I don't know. I don't have enough memory for that. <laughs> uh, but the one I just sent you was um, a phone version of a uh, Japanese keyboard. Oh, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, and the way it works is that each button lines up with a different, uh, I don't want to say vowel sound, a different sound. Mm -hmm. um, so basically all the basic ones are along the top are ah, ka, sa, ta, na, ha, ma, ya, and ra. And then at the bottom you have like the weird out, the outliers. And when you hold down the button, it gives you a choice between the, the variations on that one vowel. So for the a, ah, when you hold it down, you get a, ah, e, u, a, o. With the ka, you get ka, ki, ku, ke, ko, and so on. And that's how the, the Japanese keyboard works. That's it. That's uh, neat. And the uh, little bar at the top has autocorrect like kanji characters or phrases in there. So yeah, it, they, they, they are pretty smart with it. Cool. And that's been your educational thing for today, everyone. Education. That's what we're all here for. Even I learned something today. What was your favorite part of the film? Oh, my favorite part of the film was basically the end that just implied that it was all going to start over and keep repeating. When she's mm -hmm. uh, when they had that discussion w walking through the school, where Monica started to realize that she shouldn't have exi or that she shouldn't exist, and um, she gets pulled back down to um, you know to the new reality. Y yeah, the, to the new reality with her still alive. Matuka Kaname, do you treasure the world you live in? Or would you break its laws to follow your heart? I don't think a person should go and break the rules just because they feel like it. I suppose one day you will also be my enemy. Might as well enjoy the time we have. It's fine. And it's like she just kind of accepted that it wasn't going to go well. This was only temporary. But then all she had to do was repeat the same cycle that she's been repeating, you know, willingly all over again. It's like they're just, she's just like stuck in this like time loop of, of like horrible life for like that one moment. So you like Rebellion, I'm glad. I so, so want to see whatever 10 minutes short they had at that special event. They, I mean, they, there's no reason they should keep it a secret forever. Yeah, but I just don't know how they're going to release it. Because it's the official continuation. It's 10 minutes, but it's the official continuation. I'm just very excited about that. Um, you, uh, let's see, what else is there to cover? Um, let me see if I can pull up. There's an interesting list I wanted to read with you at like, the end of every single one of these, because I think it's a funny list. I know you're not really into let uh, into uh, role-playing games, are you? Tabletop. Um, well, I, I've, I mean, I've never actually got the opportunity to seriously play one, just, just by virtue of my group of friends that was that was never for them i mean i would oh yeah well my friend found a list of a uh, role-playing game player basically has compiled the things he is no longer allowed to do and okay. the list is entitled do not search this i'm going to read them to you i'm going to, I'm going to read i'm going to read the first 50 okay All right. the list the list is called 2400 things mr welch can no longer do during rpg <laughs> <clears throat> Cannot base characters off the Who's drummer Keith Moon. <laughs> Good start, right? Yes. A one-man band is not an appropriate bard instrument. <laughs> <laughs> there is no gnomish god of heavy artillery. I'm surprised by that, but okay. My 7th C character, Bordeaux, is not Southern Mo uh, Montaguean. Not allowed to blow all my skill points on one-point professional skills. <laughs> Synchronized panicking is not appropriate a proper battle plan. <laughs> <laughs> now what do we do? Panic? That's your answer for everything. Not allowed to use psychic powers to do the dishes. All right. How to serve dragons is not a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> My monk's lips must be in sync. I don't get it. Like old uh, martial artist movies. Now you go out into the world. Always be merciful. Oh, okay. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> God damn it. Just because my character and I can speak German doesn't mean the GM can. <laughs> Not allowed to berserk for the hell of it, especially during royal masquerades. No, that that one's bullshit. <laughs> that, <laughs> it is always appropriate to berserk for the hell of it. 
Uh, must learn at least one offensive or defensive spell if I am the sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> must not murder canon NPCs in their sleep, no matter how cliche they are. <laughs> Ogres are not kosher. <laughs> plan B is not automatically twice as much gunpowder as plan A. <laughs> <laughs> I will not beat Tomb of Horrors in less than ten minutes from memory. That's a character grinder. Yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can kind of gather from context. Collateral damage, man, is not an appropriate name for a superhero. <laughs> Says <What>? you. <laughs> <laughs> when surrendering, I am to hand the sword over hilt first. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not surrendering. Drow are not good eating. Polka is not appropriate marching music. <laughs> no longer allowed to recreate the Death Star Trench run out of genre. <laughs> there is no such thing as a gnomish pygmy war rhino. Uh, okay. Any character who has a sensitivity training center named after him will be taken away. <laughs> Even if rules allow it, I am not allowed to summon 50,000 blue whales. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that would count as your offensive and your defensive spell. <laughs> the green elf does not need food badly. I didn't get that joke, so... Um, Valley Speak has no place in fantasy setting, especially if you're the paladin. <laughs> uh, I'm trying really not... hard not to clip the mic when I laugh. <laughs> I am not to shoot every corpse in the head to make sure they aren't zombies and then uh, aren't a zombie in Twilight 2000. I'm not sure what Twilight 2000 has to do with that. Right. Um, <clears throat> the goddess of marriage chosen weapon is not a, not the whip. <laughs> what is it? I cannot have any gun that requires me to continue the damage code on the back. <laughs> I am not to kill off all the vampires in the uh, in the LARP, even if they are terminally stupid. <laughs> the backup trap handler is not whoever has the most HP at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot buy any animal in groups of 100 or more. <laughs> there is no such skill as improvised cooking. <laughs> I am not allowed to base uh, any droid off any character played by Joe Pesky. I am not allowed to convince the entire party to play R2 units. <laughs> <laughs> I am not allowed to convince the entire party to sit on the same side of the table. <laughs> they do not make black market illegal cyber weapons for rodents. <laughs> When investigating evil cultists, not allowed to just torch the decrepit mansion from the outside. <laughs> Gnomes do not have the racial ability can lick their eyebrows. <laughs> Gnomes do not have the racial ability to hold their breath for 10 minutes. <laughs> Gnomes do not have the racial ability impromptu kickstand. <laughs> What? No. I I I think I think that that's okay. <laughs> Impromptu kickstand. Having a big nose adds nothing to my seduction check. <laughs> no longer allowed to set Nazi propaganda music to snappy disco beat. <laughs> I actually want to hear some of that. <laughs> Not allowed to spend all 100 character points on 100 one point skills. <laughs> My character names are not allowed to be double entendres. <laughs> silver rhymes with silver because the computer freling says so. They do not make nair in Wookiee sizes. <laughs> the elf is restricted to decaf for the rest of the adventure. <laughs> That's not probably an inside joke. Yeah. Not allowed to blow up the Death Star before the snotty farm kid gets a shot. <laughs> Finally... Not allowed to use thermodynamic science to asphyxiate the orcs in, uh, orc cave instead of exploring it first. <laughs> that is 50 of 2,400. Oh, wow. I've currently read up to about 350 
<laughs> I'm reading like 50 a night, so it's a slog, but we can get through it together. Yes. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Yeah. So if you ever get into role playing, those are those are words to live by sometimes. Those are words to live by. Improvised cooking. <laughs> God damn. There's more cooking stuff later on. <laughs> yeah. I think one of them was, if none of the other characters put points in cooking, I am not allowed to let them starve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have have you, uh, you're not really into fantasy, but do you know about the uh, Tales of games? The Tales of Tales. Vesperia, Tales of Symphonia? Yeah, I know about them. Yeah. The improvised cooking sort of reminded me of a character from Tales of Vesperia who was like the worst cook in the party. And if you meet certain requirements, you get like skits with all the characters. And if you uh, keep cooking with her... Cooking is a pain and it's a waste of time too. Just eat some bread or a banana or something. What, you want us to just eat the ingredients raw? <laughs> <laughs> They, um, that kind of reminds me in Persona 4, there's a character who is like this very demure, very shy girl who is the daughter of an inn owner. And you would think that she'd be like perfectly suited to that, but she's terrible at cooking. Mm. And she at least once poisons the party <laughs> by accident. Yeah. Actually, both girls, both of the main, the first, like the early girls you get, they're <laughs> terrible at cooking. <laughs> All the girls are actually terrible at cooking. <laughs> I can't tell if that's sexist or progressive. Oh no! <laughs> Social justice warriors are going to have a fun day with that one. Of course, yes. there's also like potential like lesbian tension between the main, the, the first two female characters. In Persona like, Four. Yeah. All right. Uh, you should totally play it then. <laughs> <laughs> that's moving. That, that, that just that just moved uh, one up on my play this next list i've like i i still haven't beaten it like i'm literally at the last dungeon and i've not beaten the game yet mm. and i just like kind of felt like oh i'm at the last dungeon i'll, I'll get to that later <laughs> later never comes <laughs> there is no later so what else was there to talk about do we have did you see the revenant no i did not it was good <laughs> was it oscar worthy yeah, I'd say. There was a lot of stuff in it that I thought was technical limitations. Uh, like what? More so, like, because it's by the same director of Birdman. Oh. And, you know, he loves doing his long takes and his sweeping takes. Like, I, I always thought Birdman was the best, but Birdman was very controlled. It was in a controlled environment. They shot most of it indoors, and it was, it was all spoofed to look like one long take. But in this one, I feel like it was out of focus a lot. Because they would do these, like, sweeping panoramas, but then, like, end on a close-up. So I felt like half of the panorama was out of focus while they were, like, readjusting so they'd be in focus for the close-up. Um, well, yeah, yeah, while I was on set, focus is a very interesting thing to get right. Because um, I have actually seen how they do it. And, like, like I had always wondered how you, like, change focus on, like, my camcorder and stuff. You can't on a camcorder because you don't have manual input on that. It's yeah. autofocus or nothing. Mm-hmm. The cameras that they that I saw professionally used have a dial on the side for focus in specific, and they actually actually the one I saw had little points where you can mark in dry erase marker, so you could actually gauge where you want your focuses to be. Yeah, it was really cool, but it also showed like how finicky that could be. Mm -hmm. Like it took a lot of setup to get the focuses right. Yeah, there were there were a lot of those moments where I'm like. I don't think this is intentionally out of focus. It seems like there's too much going on in this scene for them to, like, actually be intending to leave it out of focus. And it seemed like uh, during the panorama across, like, a battle scene, and then they, like, close up on, on, like, a rifle and followed the rifle up to the guy holding it. I'm like, no, no, they were just readjusting focus the whole time to get it just right for the sweep up to the rifle and then his face. And I felt like that a lot throughout that movie. Interesting. Uh, how is DiCaprio? He was good. I don't I, I don't really l think he's all that great. Like but this was the the best movie I've seen him in. He did a great job. I remember now. Inception. Have we not talked about Inception yet? Uh, no, but we shouldn't. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're friends. We shouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, no, I wanna I, I wanna do a video about Inception before anything else. Cause okay. uh, yeah, 
it will probably hurt my feelings watching it, but uh, I'll look forward to the challenge. Because, <laughs> like I said, I, I I objectively hold it as one of the best movies ever made, purely on a technical, not necessarily a technical level, on a storytelling level. Interesting. <laughs> oh man. Oh. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean that, like, that, that there are several characters that don't get very well developed, that kind of thing, that I don't find very interesting. <laughs> but I've watched it a couple of times, and I very much do enjoy the movie. Yeah, I've watched it twice, and I'm I'm saving... I watched it once, I was like, why does everyone like this? And then I watched it again, and I'm like, seriously, are you just messing with me, guys? <laughs> Everyone, film critics who I don't know personally, why are you messing with me? Number 10 on my list is Inception. <laughs> and, I, yeah, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's one of the things that I'm gonna do. Before we sign off, we gotta challenge each other to another anime. Oh god, I'm gonna run out of animes to recommend. <laughs> Real fast. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, at that point, when you when you run out of anime to recommend, I will just find like a popular anime at the time, and we can watch it together and then give our thoughts on it. <laughs> like, because like you know, right now I'm kind of like down to shows that I watched like I don't know, maybe ten years ago or eight years ago at this point, which yeah, is he's kind what... of fuzzy. Which is what Reader Die was, you know, a show that I watched, yeah. you know, like almost 10 years ago. I, I kind of stopped watching anime. <laughs> Just kind of in general, like... It doesn't have to be anime, it could be something else. Uh, Admittedly, I'm not going to sit down and watch all four seasons of Breaking Bad, but... <laughs> six. <laughs> kind of. Six. You see, I don't... I'm... Yeah. How about Rick and Morty? That's the next thing I'm going to be working on. Rick and Morty? Okay, I could do that. How many episodes yeah. does that have yet? Um, 11 in the first season, 10 in the second. Okay. Okay, yeah. cause I, I've already seen one episode. I've seen the um, I, I've seen the episode where they go inside the battery. <laughs> that's so that's so good. Okay, can... well, it, my my friends they like Brick and Morty, and they have a way to get every single episode. Ah, good. I'm not going to reveal what reveal what that way is, but magic, magic. All right. And, Do you have something uh, short for me to watch? <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> one that's only twelve episodes long. Excellent. Uh, uh, well, it could go either way. I could go with No Game, No Life, or Hibeki Euphonium. I want to watch Hibeki Euphonium. Might as well challenge me to that. No, if you're going to watch it anyway, I'm going to challenge you to No Game, No Life. Cut it. <laughs> <laughs> because No Game, No Life is a fun little crazy series, and it has a very unique art style. All right. All right. I think we should call it there, then. Okay. Thank you all for staying with us, because we babble about everything and anything under the sun, including Swedish breakdancing teams. <laughs> Gotta find where those assholes ran off to. <laughs> oh god, I forgot that happened before the break. <laughs> <laughs> they have an hour head start on us. Those motherfuckers. <laughs> we'll hunt them down. We'll see them okay. break dance their way out of this. <laughs> oh, they. Oh wait, I think they know hip hop Aikido. <laughs> <laughs>